So, but yeah, let's start. Grab a beer, grab a pizza, and uh, let's uh, let's kick this off. Uh, welcome to Fortum's office. Welcome to Cloud Academy number six. Uh, so this is uh, already the sixth time that uh, we're uh, organizing this event. Uh, you may know that this uh, event is happening two times a year, uh, in the spring and uh, in in the autumn. And uh, yeah, I won't blabber here for long. Uh, we will have uh, two presenters here today, uh, Preet from the Rif, who will uh, start off uh, by talking about uh, Kubernetes and, and their journey to reaching that just from, from the two servers. Uh, we'll have uh, around half an hour uh, of Preet's talk. Uh, then if you have any questions and follow-ups, uh, we'll have around te about 10 minutes, uh, minutes of those. Uh, then we'll have a 20 minute break, so we can network, grab another bite, we grab another beer. Uh, then uh, we'll hear Tonel uh, and about his journey in up upgrading uh, 20 something uh, RDS databases in 48 hours uh, and how much stress and, uh, and fun that was. Uh, and after that uh, it's mingling, so we're uh, a bit loose with the uh, agenda, but you can expect around 9 or half past 9. Uh, uh, to the official part to be over. And yeah, Preet, take it away. Okay, thank you for such a nice introduction. I'm just making sure that everything works. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. Uh, I am Preet. I am a DevOps team lead in, in, in a company called Verip, and I will be Introducing, I think, half of my presentation, what we repeat and, uh, and what we do, uh, but uh, then we will get technical. Uh, I hope you will enjoy it. Um, from my personal past, uh, I am organizing this uh, kind of events in Tallinn called DevOps Meetup, so it's uh, nice to to come here in Tartu and see that everything is now organized, so thank you for Fortum. Uh, yeah, let's kick off. So I'm from a startup called Verif, and and we'll introduce what we do. Uh, so uh, I've been working in Verif for a bit over a year. The uh, company itself is uh, three years old, and uh, today's talk will be focusing on on the period from August 2018 to August 2019 from eyes of uh, DevOps. So, uh, I joined a little about a year ago and uh, I saw like, a nice uh, working uh, architecture. So we had three services, around six uh, developers and one DevOps engineer. Headcount of the company was around 40 persons. And it uh, was divided nicely in one-third, 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 one-third of uh, verification specialists. I'll get to, uh, to them later a bit. So those are the guys who, who know everything about the various documents in the world. One-third of engineering, so programming, QA, so on. And one-third of the rest, so sales, marketing, support management, office assistance, so on. Uh, fast forward one year, we have uh, 40 microservices from free, uh, about uh, 60 headcount in engineering for DevOps, and the total headcount, last time I checked, today it was three, 310, so tenfold increase in, uh, in one year, or about. And uh, the proportion are not the same, it's like uh, one half of, uh, of people doing verifications and uh, like half of the remaining people are in engineering and, and some more are in uh, all the other supporting places. Okay, uh, so what do we do if uh, such an amount of... Uh, of workforce. So Verif is in KYC business, it's in know your customer. Um, 
who of you has been like in, in airports? And, okay, it's easier to, to give me a show of hands like who has not seen in airports like this kind of um, a picture like when you have a passport. Nice, we have one. Um, we'll explain you later what this means. So anyway, um, there is uh, something that you need in the other side, but uh, to get there, you have to verify yourself that you are you and you have the right to, to cross the border. You don't have to present the documents, you have to exchange a few uh, pleasant uh, remarks with border guard and then you go on. So, essentially, Verify is doing this online. Um, so, how do we do this? Um, it's um, rather confusing, for example, like we have like guy in Johnny Bravo shirt, for example, what's your name? Andre. Andre, uh, in one end of the room and he has his client on the other side of the room. Uh, do we have a volunteer? <laughs> David. Uh, so David wants to know that Andre in other side of the internet is, uh, is who he claims to be. So, uh, what we do? Uh, David, David starts uh, yes, a session uh, with Verif, tells you that uh, the guy will come who claims to be Andre, and uh, I will give uh, you a token. That, uh, yeah, this is the token that I I'm expecting this guy. So, you, you are a Pass your token to Andre, Andre will come and I will ask, like, uh, can you show your face to webcam, can you show your document to webcam, and then some magic happens, some humans will look at those pictures and tell them if uh, Andre is, uh, is who he claims to be, that uh, when we are, for example, uh, the transaction is to open bank account or to uh, take loan online, that he is uh, like not forced or, or it's not in like uh, BMW um, uh, shop that uh, the, the shop clerks are trying to, to buy Bitcoin in, in the names of the clients and when everything is okay, I am going back to David and tell that, yes, this is the guy who you, uh, that you can register his, his user. <laughs> yeah, <man. Was> <laughs> <laughs> okay. I have a question. Uh, yes. If the person is not the guy, do you report to authorities? Or? Uh, we don't uh, need to report to authorities, but there has been uh, cases, especially in Estonia, that uh, uh, people are trying to get a loan for for some other person and. In these cases, we are working with authorities. It's usually the client who is, uh, like we're reporting the, the fraud to client, uh, and the client is reporting to authorities. Okay, so now you know. Uh, let's uh, start to get technical. Uh, in August 2018, like you remember, 40 persons, free microservices, uh, one DevOps engineer, uh, verified business model, which is uh, really important, and uh, uh, some uh, startup funding. Uh, we had uh, our develop, uh, developer workflow looked like uh, you have peer review code, like six persons, a meet. Um, and uh, developers running just ship it, sandbox deploy or capistrano deploy, which is a set of scripts <coughs> that will SSH to every server, do the smoke test. If smoke test passes, run the deploy, all is working. And uh, we had an environment which is uh, two servers in staging and the uh, almost same environment in production, free microservices, front-end, back-end, and API. 
uh, I'm really thankful for uh, the guys who, who were building systems before me to, to have like such a working system so to, to start them. We are, as a DevOps engineers, uh, like standing on the shoulder of giants. So everybody who comes before us, let's be thankful. Uh, okay, uh, now management comes and tells you that uh, your task is to, to keep the lights on, so no outages please, pretty please, <laughs> or we'll go bankrupt, and uh, we will start growing very fast, and very soon thereafter. What the DevOps do? Uh, Create a Kubernetes cluster. There are few uh, really important bits. So we have topology private, which means that uh, all the Kubernetes nodes and uh, and all the machines are in internal network, not visible to internet. DNS is private, so even uh, when um, you ask DNS names, that uh, you don't see what is happening inside Bastion host, so essentially you have uh, one machine you need to SSH to get access to all the cluster and then just run create. Uh, why I choose COPS? It was the tool that, that did the work at the, at the moment and when your task is to move quickly then you pick the tools that whatever works. And the second thing is that you gather all the people who are responsible for engineering and tell them, okay, uh, uh, the old way, the two, two servers, SSH, all the things, setting up new environments uh, will start taking us more and more time. So we need to do something about it. <coughs> And, uh, and setting up like uh, hardware, it uh, takes the more time that the more hardware you have, or like you need to automate it. But we don't have time for automation. So uh, containerize everything, and get an agreement that all uh, new microservices uh, will be served as Docker containers and from inside Kubernetes and write a lot of lot of guides to, to internal wiki. So whenever a developer comes to you, I need to do this. If you don't have wiki article, then you show the developer that uh, how to achieve the result, and then you write the wiki article. So when next developer comes, I need to do this, you're pointing him to wiki article. And uh, when you have great company culture, then uh, what you do is uh, you tell the developer if something doesn't work, like this because it's an outdated documentation and you find the fix, please fix the documentation. Okay, and um, uh, also another important technical bit of, uh, <coughs> of information in this slide is that uh, we are using uh, AWS users to authenticate, to, to cluster. So we avoid creating like separate user management system for uh, uh, for every framework that we're using. We have uh, AWS users, you have AWS users, these users have rights, you use this to authenticate to, to Kubernetes. Okay, uh, everything going well. We're starting to have problems um, Kubernetes is essentially um, orchestrator. So you tell uh, Kubernetes that I want uh, 10 services, those services uh, use so much CPU, so much memory, so much disk. I have uh, three, three big, big badass virtual machines. Please find out somehow how to distribute those services and make sure they're running every time. Uh, and uh, one, one small question: yes. Do you have your own hardware? Or? We are using AWS Cloud, uh, and we are uh, renting hardware from Cloud. 
because um, because of the growth. So when you have uh, your your own dedicated hardware and your um, incoming traffic is fluctuating like tenfold, then uh, you need to plan like months ahead, like in order to get server. <coughs> Yeah, you need to play, uh, start placing order now, and and those uh, this hardware can arrive you like three months later or something, in, in big scale. Uh, of course, there are uh, when you order one virtual small virtual machine, you get can get it tomorrow. Uh, but uh, that was uh, in in Kubernetes case. So you have uh, your uh, big virtual machines. And you tell them that I run. I need to run uh, ten or twenty microservices on it. And you learn pretty fast that uh, you need to limit your resources. So uh, when uh, when uh, one one service starts uh, at some point using like all the memory. You don't want this service to, to start affecting everyone else that uh, is sharing this uh, hardware. And also you want to set like your CPU limits so uh, that uh, when you get attacked or something, one service starts to compute all the SS yeah, all the hashes or, or tries to find all the prime numbers and then needs uh, all, all the CPU in your cluster. It doesn't get it. But you rather want this service to fail fast <coughs> and and go on, so your developers can can fix the problem. Okay. Who says how how big the limit should be? Uh, developer says essentially, like uh, you have to you start with an estimate, and then you you work towards the bettering your your estimates. But uh, having like uh, no limits at all, this is uh, very quickly no go. But you can have no limits. You can have, or you can have default limits. For example, if I'm not setting limits, then it's some reasonable thing. One more question, excuse me. Yep. And, uh, if you if it hits the limit, uh, then it scales automatically, or just uh, stops it there. It depends. When you're hitting memory limit, you are getting uh, your old Linux friend Onkill. <laughs> Which is essentially shooting your application in the head. When you're hitting CPU limit, uh, you're essentially not getting more CPU cycles. So uh, your application will uh, work um, slower. And you get uh, in your monitoring system a lot. Yeah, hey, you are using 100% of your limits. Can you do it also disk IO and network IO? No. Uh, or that's just. I haven't researched this. No. <laughs> so I think no. There will be slide. Okay. So um, everything is uh, going on. We're uh, growing, and then suddenly we have uh, funny guys from machine learning, and, and machine learning is uh, is very fast growing. Python. How do you say? Uh, discipline of programming. And they come to, to DevOps with like nice, uh, interesting uh, requests. Hey, guys, can I have a really, really many CPU right now? Because I don't know, I have those images. I need to the image, and I have to run those models. And, and now I'm getting back to your question, like, w why are we running in cloud and uh, not ordering our own hardware? It's uh, with Kubernetes as easy as uh, I'm creating a node group, telling that this node group is for machine learning. I need like number of nodes. Use your imagination. I do cluster rolling update, and bang, my uh, uh, cluster has 20 or 40 more CPU and. Uh, hundreds of gigabytes of memory, so please, Mr. Machine Learning guys, use it. Uh, what you want to do is uh, is tell your uh, like uh, node groups that uh, 
we have some kind of affinity if my machine learning uh, developers are sometimes a bit greedy and tend to take uh, everything from every resource from cluster then I'm telling that okay those guys then develop uh, and then deploy only in machine learning class uh, machine learning node group so uh, when they fill their resources yes they're sad but uh, everything else is uh, is working and, and when core or API mm, uh, guys are deploying their code, they're not affected. Yes, question? Did I understand it correctly that you let the machine learning guys run their model training on the main Kubernetes cluster in the beginning? Uh, not the model training, but the actual trained models. So yeah. serving, so do, serving APIs. Do you yes. have, do have a, a several, well, do you have a single control plane for all the environments, so several of them? Uh, depends on architecture, uh, but, uh, but, but like you, you, you want to have uh, like a small number of clouds with like large number of machines. At some point, it, it makes sense to to create a new cloud, but uh, from management perspective uh, or like ma management overhead perspective, you want to keep like the number of uh, Kubernetes clusters. Uh, What's your small. number? Yeah. What's your number? <laughs> it's not uh, two, like 20. Ten, less than 10. So. Um, <coughs> okay, uh, and uh, to monitor how we are uh, using our cluster, uh, New Relic helped a lot, so you can see the the resource usage and, and if somebody is, uh, is behaving badly. And uh, when playing with, uh, with node groups that you start to embrace like this uh, cattle versus pet mentality. So when uh, some uh, Kubernetes node is, is misbehaving or we have some kind of AWS problem, then you just tell that, okay, offload every service from the node and shut it down and suddenly new node appears. Uh, and you have all the Docker services there. Uh, okay, but machine learning guys are not happy with this. So, like, they are happy for for few days. They come back to you. It's like we saw that CPU is good, but graphical processor they're much much more faster. Can I have them? And they're looking at like, okay, it's not like supported thing. But uh, yeah, uh, Kubernetes is uh, evolving fast, and uh, NVIDIA has, has rather nice support. So we had to do a, a week of work, like creating uh, Kubernetes nodes that uh, can uh, provide uh, GPU service to to inside uh, a Docker container, and we are running again. Uh, yeah, discoveries that uh, GPUs are not shareable resource. For example, like uh, if uh, in case of CPU, we can <coughs> put uh, ten services and tell it, okay, you guys are sharing this one CPU. Like everyone is getting one percent, and we have like. 90% uh, free resource. Then, in case of uh, graphical processor, when one service claims it, it's theirs. No one else can have it. Um, we are running our uh, stuff in Ireland, and uh, we experimented using um, spot instances, which means that uh, you can rent from Amazon uh, their uh, excess. Um, uh, excess hardware for uh, like uh, three times lower price but uh, then you, you discover that at some periods of, of the month suddenly everyone be, wants to do the GPU calculation I don't know Netflix is uh, rendering their new movies or, or something uh, and uh, but also discover that uh, the GPU is kind of um, uh, how to say, non-isolated resource. When one uh, developer is going inside their container and telling that uh, 
my NVIDIA visible devices is old, then uh, you can from one container grab and, and use like whichever GPU they, they want. Okay, so moving on, meanwhile, uh, we have a buy-in from, from developers, all the old services are like rewritten and then put into Docker containers. And, uh, and suddenly we have uh, all our environments uh, running inside Kubernetes. And this gives us the nice uh, opportunity for, for developers that, uh, okay, you, you want a staging environment, we will create you one. We will just uh, spin up all the, all the services and tell that, yes, this is, this is yours. Um, and uh, with Docker images, we have some subset of, uh, of base Docker images with, from which uh, all the other Docker containers are built. So when we need to apply a security patch or change some library, we are changing base images and we are doing rebuild for all the systems. When tests are good, to production. And, yeah. Again, uh, when uh, devs are doing a great job, kudos to them. So, we're in time. Um, now, the question you asked, Martin. <laughs> when some service uh, starts misbehaving and eats up all your TCP memory, <laughs> you suddenly realize that, okay, the other services still are affected. And uh, we haven't figured out uh, other ways than, than to monitor. And, and when this happens, like then automatic node offload. And yeah, this is the, um, the thing that's luckily not happening uh, really often. How do you monitor? Uh, new Relic. So you have. Uh, you actually are building like uh, Docker, uh, small Docker containers that uh, do uh, monitoring. So they essentially take a look at it. Uh, you ask from Kubernetes, like, uh, hey, can I uh, elevate my resources a bit? So I want to actually see, the, read the, the, the file system and, and, uh, and memory usage, and, uh, and from there, uh, send your data to to new running and then to external monitoring systems. Yeah. Uh, more uh, auto scaling and suddenly the service starts getting traction. So uh, you have um, at some point your. 10% uh, service is used like 10% and then suddenly increases tenfold. Um, with Kubernetes, uh, we have uh, two ways of auto scaling. So, one is uh, pod level, like pod is uh, essentially a bit more complex, but uh, essentially an abstraction of, uh, of one Docker container. Um, it's really easy. You tell it the resource that I want to to have. For example, like I want my service to be using 50% of CPU. Let's go. Or I want my service to use like one gigabyte of memory. Uh, Kubernetes takes a look what's the actual CPU or memory usage and then computes like, okay, how many uh, actual instances of, uh, of this uh, microservice I need. Um, yeah, sometimes uh, Kubernetes starts like hysteresis. It takes a look at, okay, this service uh, is a bit overloaded. So um, let's uh, spin up uh, 10 new machines or 10, 10 new pods. And then uh, Next time it realizes, okay, it's like kind of underloaded, let's kill 10 pods, and this is like repeating cycle. So uh, um, it gets better with uh, Kubernetes releases, but uh, you still have to 
do some fine tuning. Uh, and the second thing is, uh, is node level auto scaling like actual virtual machines that uh, I need uh, less resource uh, at night than, than in, uh, during uh, peak hours uh, we are still researching but uh, we're getting uh, there. Okay, uh, for the future, uh, first we, we spun up our uh, Kubernetes cluster with, uh, with COPS, which is a really nice tool to do this, but uh, Amazon is, uh, is having like a managed Kubernetes cluster and uh, we've uh, moved there because uh, doing the upgrades is, uh, is easier, like inside Amazon. And we're also researching uh, multi-cluster deployments and uh, spinning up some clusters in, in Google or like that we are essentially not uh, bound by, by Amazon service. Yeah, and I think I've used my 30 minutes of talking. So this was our year-long journey. I hope it was amusing enough. Now we'll have questions. Yeah, you have uh, yeah, yeah, I just wanted to ask, you, <coughs> you mentioned all the criticism at the very end, but uh, was the move to Kubernetes specifically motivated by being able to be cloud agnostic? Uh, for example, I've heard not, a great, uh, not great things about uh, Amazon's managed Kubernetes as opposed to, for example, I don't know, Google Cloud's Kubernetes uh, or even just ECS on Amazon in general. I can tell you uh, yeah, my experience with ECS, uh, and uh, it's uh, kind of uh, from operational perspective uh, nightmare to manage. But uh, uh, the decision to, to move to Kubernetes was uh, was from uh, was from the the need that we need to Dockerize and. Uh, as we were using Amazon in uh, 2018, uh, as you mentioned, DKS was a uh, new service and, and it was pretty like raw. And uh, this was the case that we didn't start with DKS uh, in, the, in the process in the begin from the beginning, but uh, rather uh, spin up our own cluster, learn how Kubernetes works in the process, and uh, and get smaller like uh, and uh, now like one year later EKS has become more stable and, and we are kind of switching over there. What version in uh, EKS uh, today supports Kubernetes? EKS uh, one fourteen, one fourteen, fourteen yes. something uh, like that. Yeah. Okay. And with COPS it was uh, it was always like uh, this uh, last. Uh, Last uh, stable version that is soon to be obsolete that you can could could use with uh, with cops. So it was uh, also motivator that. Okay. How do you handle breaking changes for upgrades? I mean, it was like one twelve, one thirteen, where in the etcd version change. Uh, we spin up new cluster. We deploy everything there. We see that the new cluster is working, and then we dump the old cluster. So uh, uh, our architecture is built in a way that uh, like containers do not uh, contain any actual data. And uh, all the disk images that are needed, they are like uh, external resources that can be mounted inside uh, the Kubernetes cluster. Okay, how do you manage the service discovery in, in different uh, Kubernetes clusters? Uh, DNS? Like and uh, service discovery is uh, is one thing that Kubernetes is uh, is doing. Yeah, but, but, but there is no in, in there is no clusters. cross cross cluster communication. There is no cross cluster communication, or when the cross cluster communication is happening, it's like one uh, DNS uh, name. So 
if, if I deploy a new cluster, then uh, everything is uh, is uh, inside the cluster. Is uh, every, every microservice that need to, needs to speak to each other need to be in, inside one cluster. Okay. How do you manage uh, unique data or business data? How do you provide the business continuity? Uh, as I said, um, like the data is uh, outside Kubernetes cluster. You have uh, uh, S3 buckets, you have Amazon uh, disk volumes, you have your uh, highly reliable database system, you have your message queue that is like kind of outside Kubernetes. Okay. And uh, the Amazon region is uh, failing. Amazon has uh, inside one region. It has uh, yeah, three no. regions yeah. and uh, like free it, it availability it, zones. But uh, free availability uh, zones. But anyway, the question is, uh, how do you protect yourself uh, for disasters? Uh, this is the like multi-cluster uh, deployment that we are uh, looking into. So far, has not. Uh, Happened. We've had uh, availability zone breakdowns and, and really slow network from, from Amazon to, to certain clusters. But uh, again, uh, you have to choose your, uh, your regions. For example, like North Virginia, it has five availability zones and uh, uh, yeah, you need to, to try really hard to, to break it. Or like Amazon. So you don't, don't have any unique data stored inside Kubernetes clusters. Yes. Yes, thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, you